The Naval Historical Foundation presents Admiral James L. Holloway and the Battle of Surigao Strait. Shortly after 0300, the USS Benyon, a Fletcher-class destroyer, made the first visual contact with the Japanese battleship. It was 25 October 1944, and I was standing up through the hatch in the ship's main director, uh, scanning the horizon with my binoculars. The rumble of heavy gunfire had become continuous, and the lower quadrant of the southern sky reflected a steady glow from the gun, gun muzzle flashes, and the PT boats had sprung their ambush and, on the Japanese column and triggered a fierce firefight. The Battle of Surigao Strait in Lady Gulf was underway. There was a tug on my trouser leg and the sailor at the pointer station next to me motioned to my eyepiece. Looking through the magnification of the director optics, the scene to the south became much clearer. The crosshairs of the lens were fixed at the base of the Jumbo Pagoda structure of a Japanese battleship superstructure. The flashes from her main turret salvos and the rapid fire of the secondary battery were lighting up the entire ship. Her bow wave showed she was making at least 25 knots. I couldn't suppress a gasp and I muttered, it looks just like the picture of a Japanese battleship. The sailor next to me said, Lieutenant, that is a Japanese battleship. The radar operator sitting behind me tersely reported that he had picked up the target and was getting reliable ranges. I reported to the captain who was out on the wing of the bridge, Captain, we are tracking a battleship and locked on with a fire control radar. The captain acknowledged and added that the PT boats were reporting that two Japanese battleships, a cruiser and at least three destroyers had just passed through the Narrows. He further added that our target was to be the second battleship. He said, let me know when you have a fire control solution on the big boy. Have the gun battery ready, but don't shoot unless specifically ordered to. We've been directed to make a torpedo attack with five fish. His voice was clear and businesslike. <clears throat> Going back to the director range finding optics, I could now see the two battleships in column. <clears throat> I moved the crosshairs to the second one and got a confirmation from the radar operator that the radar was locked on, and I informed the captain that we had a firing solution on the assigned target. The captain acknowledged, very well, train out the torpedo tubes and guns, but don't launch or shoot until I give the order. I switched the five-inch guns in both quintuple torpedo mounts to my control in the director, and again, standing up in the hatch, looked aft to check that the torpedo tubes were trained out on the ship's beam. The Benyon was now running in and out of rain squalls, and it was very dark. I could barely make out the other two destroyers in our three-ship division. Like Benyon, both were Fletchers. We were keeping a 300-foot interval in a loose column. The division was loitering at five knots close to the western coastline of Lady Gulf. Using land clutter to hide from the enemy radars, it gave us some cover. It was quiet in the director. Each member of the director crew was absorbed in his particular duties. Our small talk had been used up long ago. For the past seven months, the five of us, four sailors, a chief, and myself, had been together eight hours a day in this hot, cramped steel box, standing watches or at general quarters, battle stations, shooting at Japanese aircraft. We considered ourselves experienced veterans, having fought together at Saipan, Tinian, Guam, and Peliliu. I was a 22-year-old lieutenant and Benyon's gunnery officer. This was my second destroyer assignment since graduation from the Naval Academy in June of 42. After General MacArthur's landing at Lady on 20 October 1944, it was fully expected by our fleet commander that the Japanese Navy would attack Allied forces in the Lady Gulf area. There were reports from our submarines and patrol aircraft indicating that two separate Japanese task forces were headed in the direction of Lady Gulf. The hundreds of Allied transports and supply ships, amphibious craft, and support vessels, all anchored off the port of Tacloban, providing support and resupply for the Army uh, forces ashore, were prime targets for the Japanese fleet. 
The commander of the Seventh Fleet, Rear Admiral Jesse B. Oldendorf, uh, expected that we would probably be involved in a night action within 24 hours. And he had six old battleships, eight cruisers, and 26 destroyers to stop the Japanese force that was expected to attack through the Surigao Strait. Benyon's squadron of nine destroyers were organized into three divisions of three ships each. Benyon's division was assigned to attack the center column of Japanese battleships and cruisers after they had emerged from the Surigao Strait area. The plan was for coordinated torpedo attacks to be conducted separately by each of the three divisions. Each division would approach in a tight three-ship column and each destroyer would successively launch a salvo of five torpedoes as it reached its pre-planned launching point. Then the destroyer would retire to the designated post-attack rendezvous area. Shortly after 0300, the soft purr of the idling fire room blowers suddenly rose to a high-pitched whine. The bridge had rung up full power. The director began to tremble and the deck plates vibrated from the propeller cavitation. As the ship accelerated, almost simultaneously, the ship's general announcing system announced, starting run in for the attack. I had been momentarily diverted and when I again looked through the optics, I was startled to see how much larger the image of the Japanese battleship had grown. The enemy column was headed directly toward us at 25 knots and closing fast. The three destroyers in our section turned in column to a southerly course to intercept the enemy and still maintaining the 300 foot interval between ships. Standing in the open hatch of the director, I could watch the entire panorama of the two converging, converging fleets. And through the high-powered lenses of the director, the enemy ships could be seen in stark detail. As our destroyers broke out of the shadow of the shoreline, we were immediately taken under fire by the Japanese battleships and cruisers. It was strange to be rushing through the dark, closing with the enemy at a relative speed of more than 50 knots, not firing our own guns, but receiving the steady gunfire of the Japanese ships. We were running through the explosions of their shots falling around us. The towering splashes of the incoming 14-inch and 8-inch shells were close enough to wet our weather decks. Both sides were also firing star shells, and their illumination added to the eerie aspect of the scene. As the Japanese came into range, Ohlendorf's battleships and cruisers, which were deployed in an east-west line to cross the T at the top of the Japanese column, opened up with their main batteries. All along the northern horizon, enormous billows of flame from their 16 and 14-inch main battery guns lit up the battle line. Directly over our destroyers stretched a procession of tracers as the battleship shells converged on the Japanese column. The apparent slowness of the projectiles was surprising taking 15 to 20 seconds in their trajectory before reaching the target. They seemed to hang in the sky. Through the director optics, I could clearly see the explosions of these shells bursting on the Japanese ships, setting up cascades of flame as they ripped away topside gun mounts and erupted in fiery sheets of molten steel. They were tearing into the heavy army plate, armor plate. When the first destroyer in our division reached the prescribed launch point, the enemy's range was about 6,000 yards. When it was Benyon's turn to turn into the attack, the captain called out, launch torpedoes, and the Japanese battleship completely filled the viewing glass of my optics. The crosshairs indicated that the torpedo aim points were stabilized on the waterline just below the foremast. Glowing dials showed the torpedo tubes were trained clear and the torpedo gyro set. I pushed the fire button on the torpedo control console and stood up to see our five fish shoot out of their tubes and I could hear them slap the water and they were running hot and straight. Our destroyer formation had become ragged. The ships were maneuvering independently to avoid enemy gunfire. As Benyon retired to the north at 30 knots, the scene of action was one of growing confusion. The Japanese formation had disintegrated. Some of her ships were circled out, of, circled out of control. Others were dead in the water. Many were on fire, and they shuddered from massive internal explosions. Still others were unrecognizable with bows gone, sterns blown away, and topsides mangled. Suddenly, 
Surprisingly, a large warship loomed out of the darkness and confusion on our port bow. Using the joystick control, I swung the director to aim directly at this new target. I called down to the captain to report the new contact. It was at this juncture that the unidentified warship commenced firing at what appeared to be its secondary battery. This immediately established her identity as hostile because the salvos were ripple fire. This was a characteristic of the Japanese naval gunfire installations. It's in contrast to the simultaneous salvos of U.S. warships. I shouted to the captain that the ship was Japanese. No sooner had he acknowledged this intelligence than the sailor on the director range finder reported that we were locked on with fire control radar and already had a good solution for a torpedo attack. Again, I shouted this information to the captain on the bridge with the recommendation that we fire all of our five remaining torpedoes because the ship was obviously a cruiser or a battleship too lucrative a target to ignore without hesitation. And the captain repeated this instruction to fire all five of our remaining fish at this close-in target. I passed these instructions by sound-powered phone to the torpedo officer. He was manning the Mark 27 torpedo director back at the tubes, wearing the telephones himself and personally making the target data inputs and settings into the torpedoes. I told him to set the torpedoes for deep their recommended depth for setting but battleship or cruiser for a battleship or cruiser target so that the torpedo would hit the vessel below its torpedo defense blisters. Again, I looked aft and saw the quintuple, quintuple torpedo mount training out to port. I stood up in the hatch, reached over to the red torpedo firing buttons, and launched all five torpedoes in a salvo. Still standing up in the hatch, I could see the torpedoes come out of their tubes in quick succession with their motors running, slap the water, submerge, and head for the Japanese heavy. Now only 3,000 yards away. I felt sure we would get a hit with our spread of five torpedoes. We were too close to have missed. Benyon heeled sharply as the captain ordered left full rudder, all ahead flank. We swung to a northerly course, headed for the post-attack rendezvous point. At daylight on October 25, 1944, the crew on board the Benyon was tired. We had been up more than 24 hours since 0400 the day before. At that time, we were loading 5-inch ammunition from a Liberty ship anchored off Tacloban Harbor as Navy Wildcat fighters tangled with zeros overhead. We had been at general quarters for more than 12 hours now as we listened to the reports come in over the voice radio and saw more survivors clinging to the smoking wreckage of a Japanese fleet, we sensed that a great victory had been won. A major Japanese force of battleships and cruisers had been immolated with serious damage to only one of our ships, the Fletcher destroyer Grant. But there remained the paperwork, the chore of writing the after-action reports. These are first drafted, drafted at the battle station level then integrated it across the many echelons of command all the way up to Commander 7th Fleet, who was Admiral Rutmold Oldendorf. Somewhere in this paper trail, the fact that Benyon had made a second torpedo attack against an unidentified capital ship fell through the cracks in a process of after-action analysis. Admiral Oldendorf consequently decided that the destroyer squadron 56 torpedo attack which was carried out as a single coordinated effort, had failed to score a hit on its assigned target, the second Japanese battleship in the column. That was because the Japanese column had reversed course 180 degrees just when the destroyer squadron 56 launched its first salvo of torpedoes. For this reason, Benyon's second salvo of five torpedoes was not included in the analysis of the destroyer squadron 56 attacks. Nor was it mentioned in the most respected of the unclassified post-war accounts of the Battle of Lady Gulf, Samuel Elliott Morrison's magnum opus, History of the United States Naval Operations in World War II. It probably would have remained entirely out of the records and accounts of the Battle of Surigao Strait were it not for the independent research of a Naval Historical Foundation staff man. Nearly half a century later, Foundation researcher John Riley, by chance, encountered the post-World War II study conducted by the Naval War College of the Battle of Lady Gulf. It was by then de declassified. 
He sent me the copy, but ga I gave it just a routine scan and then put it on my desk where I overlooked it until 2008 when I picked it up as an unclassified source to another aspect of the Battle of Surigao Strait. And that is when I discovered a key reference to the Benyon's role in the sinking of the Yamashiro. The U.S. Navy War College report stated, and I quote, the battleship Yamashiro <clears throat> continued to close the enemy as she advanced. Shortly after being taken under fire, she began to burn. At 3.56, she turned to the west, and 4.05, she was hit by a torpedo fired by the Benyon. At 0359 local time, the Benyon had fired a second salvo of second, a second salvo of intermediate speed torpedoes at what was at that time thought to be a battleship or a cruiser. And it hit the Yamashiro. At 0419, Yamashiro suddenly sank, according to a surviving Yamashiro warrant officer. And so Benyon's contribution to the victory at Surigao Strait was properly recognized and documented.